Hi, I'm Professor David Attlee, and this is Topics in Astronomy. Thank you for joining me. In this video, I'll talk to you about general relativity, where it comes from, a little bit about how it works, and some of the evidence supporting the theory. Let's get started. If you've been following along with the course, you might be familiar with the equation that appears on the slide, which is Newton's theory of gravity, sometimes called and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. One important question that arose following the development of special relativity at the beginning of the 20th century was how time plays a role in this equation. So have a look at this equation. Where does time show up? Think for a second. Go ahead and pause the video if you need to. I'll wait. Okay, I feel bad. This is a trick question. Um, so if you came up with an answer, uh, it could very well be correct. For example, the distance might change over time, the force changes over time, but there's no explicit reliance of time in this equation. And that means that there's no delay between a change, say, in one of the masses and a change in the force felt by the other mass. So if I were to snap my fingers and change the mass of the sun, according to Newton, the Earth would feel that change instantly. Put, to put that another way, the information about the change in mass has to travel at infinite speed. And when you have infinities start showing up in your laws of physics, it's a big problem. There is, in fact, another important restriction based on the theory of special relativity itself as developed by Albert Einstein. That restriction is that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, not even information. So no physical thing and no information can exceed this speed limit, which is universal. But Newton's theory of gravity seems to require information not only to travel faster than light, but infinitely fast. And so the speed of light is really, really fast, but infinity is much faster still. This is clearly a problem. And this is a problem that Einstein spent about 10 years of his life working to try to fix. This is one important line of evidence suggesting the need for something called a theory of general relativity, an upgraded theory of gravity, but it's not the only line of evidence. So if you ask the question, what happens to the Earth if the sun disappears, how gravity behaves is key to being able to answer this question. So first, what would happen to the Earth if the sun's gravity disappeared? The answer, which I hope you came up with, is that in the absence of gravity holding Earth in orbit, Earth should just travel in a straight line according to Newton's first law, the law of inertia. So if I snap my fingers and make the sun go away, then the Earth leaves its orbit. But there's a delay. There's gonna have to be a delay of at least eight minutes for the information about the change in the sun's mass from big to zero, to traverse the distance between the Earth and the Sun. The same amount of time it would take for us to notice that the light from the Sun has disappeared. So I'd snap my fingers and we'd have eight minutes of sunlight before the world would suddenly go dark. Okay, so what is the actual solution to this problem? Einstein came up with a really elegant idea, which is the notion that gravity isn't really a force at all, so much as it's a manifestation of the properties of space and time. Einstein's theory of general relativity, the modern theory of gravity, says that the presence of mass causes the very fabric of space and time to curve. And that in turn, the curvature of that fabric of space and time tells mass how to move. So if I were to change the mass of the Earth or the Sun or anything, in order for that 
information about that change to communicate, space would have to uncurve. So if you make space a little bit stiff and limit the speed by which changes in curvature can travel, that solves this problem of limiting the speed of information and also provides a mechanism which was present in Newton's theory of gravity but a little bit unsatisfying to explain how gravity actually works. As he developed his theory of general relativity, Einstein was able to make one important testable prediction that he already knew the answer to, which was to look at the orbit of Mercury. Mercury and all planets undergo something called precession. So the direction of their orbit shifts over time. Hopefully you remember that planets all travel along elliptical orbits. So the orbits are stretched out, they're not perfect circles, and the orientation of that ellipse will change over time. That's what's being illustrated on the right-hand side of the slide. At number one, we have an ellipse that's kind of oriented this way, and then over time, it swings around. All planets do this, and the precession is mostly caused by the gravity from the orbits of other planets tugging on the first planet and adjusting its orbit a little bit. Jupiter is a big culprit for this because it's so massive and exerts a strong gravity throughout the solar system. But Mercury processes more than it should given the known masses and positions of all of the other planets. This was a big puzzle in 19th century physics. There were a bunch of astronomers who went out looking for an extra planet that they had sort of preemptively named Vulcan that would account for the change in Mercury's orbit. Turns out there is no planet Vulcan, so all of the observations claiming to find it were erroneous. And instead, what's happening is that one of the weird effects of general relativity called time dilation causes Mercury's orbit to process just a little bit faster than it would under Newton's theory of gravity. General relativity successfully predicts this extra precession, and that was one of Einstein's early tests to make sure that general relativity was working properly. Another important test is the ability of gravity to bend light. Now, light lacks mass, so according to Newton, it shouldn't feel any gravity. There are some caveats to that if you want to work at high-level physics, but for our purposes, let's just assume that Newton's theory of gravity says that you can't bend light. But light still has to travel through space across time. And therefore, if you start bending space and time, then light is going to have to travel a bent path in exactly the same way that a planet does. So if we have a star that's near the sun, the light from that star is going to be bent a little bit by the sun's gravity, and it's going to arrive at the Earth in a slightly different direction than normal. Let's look at the graphic on the right-hand side of the slide. So imagine the yellow star, which is behind the sun. So the sun is between the Earth and the star, and we can't see it. But some of the light from that star is going to be bent by the sun's gravity in this effect that we call gravitational lensing. And that light will then arrive at the Earth. So if you're an observer on the Earth looking up with a telescope, you would see that star not at the yellow position, which is where it truly is, but instead at the position marked in red. So you'd see an apparent shift in the position of the star due to the sun's gravity. So that sounds really cool. That's a great test, except there's a problem. When the sun is in the sky, it's daytime, and you can't see the stars during the daytime. So how are you going to actually make this test? Well, it turns out there is one time when you can actually see stars during the daytime, and that is during a total solar eclipse. So if you can find a total solar eclipse, and you can go and observe a bunch of stars near the sun at the time of the eclipse, you could try and make this test. So this is a total solar eclipse. Um, the light from the sun has been blocked out by the disk of the Earth's moon. We're seeing only the sun's corona, which is its hot, low-density atmosphere. And then under the right circumstances, you could see some stars near the sun. So you could try and measure 
the position of those stars and see if they've shifted at all compared to where they normally are. This was conducted successfully in 1919 by a group of astronomers led by the famous English astronomer Sir Arthur Eddington. Eddington and his colleagues traveled to an observatory in the Canary Islands after the end of World War I to observe this total solar eclipse, and they measured a shift in the positions of stars that was exactly consistent with the expectation based on Einstein's then hypothesis of general relativity. There's a snippet on the left-hand side of the slide from the New York Times following the announcement of the discovery, and in red, it's underlined, it says, Einstein predicted the deflection of the starlight when it passed the sun, and the recent eclipse has provided a demonstration of the correctness of the prediction. So it's all very formal. This is really exciting. This is concrete observational evidence for a brand new and frankly kind of odd theory for how gravity works. And so this successful prediction is one of the things that helped move Einstein's ideas towards theory status. General relativity makes a bunch of other really interesting predictions that can be relevant in different situations. For weak gravity, so for conditions like those that are typical in the solar system, the theory of general relativity reduces to the predictions given by Newton, which is nice. It's good that you can upgrade the theory without breaking all of the stuff that was working before. But once you start getting to very strong gravity, some weird things start to happen. One of the earliest realizations from the mathematics of general relativity was that they provided a structure that predicted the existence of a weird category of objects called black holes. If you take enough mass and you compact it down into a really tiny volume, the gravity gets so strong that nothing, not even light, can escape. Uh, this was originally proposed by the physicist Carl Schwarzschild um, around 1920, and at the time, most people thought it was just a mathematical curiosity, that nature would never really allow something like that to exist. But of course, we now know that black holes do exist, and in fact, they are at least relatively common. There are lots of them scattered throughout the Milky Way and throughout the broader universe. And general relativity also gives us a structure to understand events like the Big Bang. So the event that marks the beginning of the universe that you'll hear about in class. What is this black hole thing? It's not an object, it's a region of space. It's a region of space where mass has been packed so tightly that the escape speed of that region of space exceeds the speed of light. And if the escape speed exceeds the speed of light, nothing can reach the escape speed and therefore nothing can escape. Everything falls in, gets stuck, and can never come out again. I have an extensive video talking about how black holes work and some of the physics connected to them. I encourage you to go and have a look at it. I think black holes are really fun and a lot of uh, students do as well. So if you've got some time, go ahead and check that out. They have really important and fascinating effects on the space around them. They distort the flow of time and they stretch out light. You can see a very good rendering of what a black hole might look like across the bottom of the slide. This is an image from the film Interstellar, and it's one of the best renderings of a black hole ever put on film because the famous gravitational physicist Kip Thorne consulted on the film to help the producers get good images of the gravitational phenomena that are a central aspect of the plot line of that movie. One important thing to remember about black holes though it makes science fiction less fun, they don't suck. Black holes exert gravity just like everything else. Um, so if you took the sun and replaced it with a black hole of one solar mass, the Earth's orbit wouldn't change. It's going to stay pretty much the same. You have to get really close to a black hole before you start getting those weird effects that I was talking about. Again, go and have a look at that video that I referred to earlier. It's really fun. So, so far, we've talked about general relativity, which is Einstein's modern theory for how gravity works. General relativity provides a mechanism to explain where gravity comes from through the distortion of space and time 
by the presence of mass. These distortions cause objects to follow curved paths, creating things like planetary orbits, as well as the effect of gravitational lensing. Changes in the curvature of space propagate at the speed of light, so it limits the transfer of information, solving that problem that was present in Newton's theory of gravity. And the theory of general relativity makes a bunch of testable predictions that allow us to determine whether or not it's doing a good job describing the world. And these vary from the lensing of starlight to the existence of black holes to time dilation, which is extremely important for GPS satellites. So GPS, in order to work, relies on the correctness of general relativity. So it provides really interesting science fiction in the form of black holes and also provides practical applications for everyday life. Thanks for watching, and I hope to talk to you again soon about another topic in astronomy.